All right, good morning. Uh, today is a uh, lecture on the brain. Let's start off with showing you how we can view the brain in the skull and performing a craniotomy. Uh, simply put, a craniotomy is where you remove um, the skull cap with a bone saw. Skull caps can be removed, and well, when there's a brain inside, that's what you see with the picture on the left. I give you the page numbers there. Where, um, well, they show you a couple of things here. You see the brain, the cerebrum, on this side, and on the other side, the left side, they, they've left the dura matter covering the brain. Now, if you were to pull the brain, the whole brain and brain stem out, you get the middle picture of the skull. And the middle picture shows how the dura mater is still on the bone. <clears throat> and they do show some cranial nerves and other things exiting the skull. Now, the picture on the right you should be familiar with. This is just the, the dry bones. Okay. But that, again, this is our superior view of the cranial base that the brain sits on. So, um, the cranial fossa are the depressions in the cranial base which support regions of the brain. Describe them as depressions in the cranial base. That support brain regions. And that picture is supposed to help you uh, understand that. AMP stands for, well, the A is anterior cranial fossa. The M is middle and the P is posterior. Those are on your skull study list. Well, the picture on the right shows you the brain in those fossa, and basically the anterior cranial fossa, what you can see is um, they support the frontal lobes. And the middle cranial fossa supports the temporal lobes, support temporal. And the posterior cranial fossa supports the cerebellum. So these are all the major brain regions. And so I just basically taught you how the brain sits on the cranial base. So when you remove the entire uh, brain from the skull, you get the next slide. And we can look at the major regions of the brain and the central nervous system uh, shown there. So there's some leader lines here. I thought I could just label them right on the figure that I ran on the whiteboard.
major divisions of the CNS, the entire central nervous system, basically I'm just lecturing on the brain today, is um, you have what's called the cerebrum. which is what we kind of know is the brain. It's the wrinkly part. When people say cerebrum, I think when people say brain. Now the picture on the uh, left, this is kind of a, a removal of the just, just the brain and all the features. And this is a mid-sagittal cut right here. So the cerebrum is this entire part right here that looks like a boxer's glove. That whole thing is the cerebrum. But there are different lobes, which I just noted over there. Um, like for example, this one back here, that's the occipital lobe, the back of your head. Occipital lobe. The one in the front here is the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. And then the thumb of the boxer's glove is the temporal lobe. And um, the one back here, they put the leader line right there. It's the parietal lobe. So leader lines kind of give you a general idea of where the lobes are, but if you work with a brain that's a colored brain, that we have four over there, it, it'll show you the lobes a little bit better. But basically on the back, you have the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, in the front you have the frontal lobe, and the parietal lobe. Notice that the lobes of the cerebrum are named after the, the skull bones that cover them. Lobes named after skull bones or cranial bones. Okay, so that's a major region of the brain. Now, if you cut the brain in half, you can see more regions. Sagittal cut, sagittal cut. You actually have a right and a left cerebral hemisphere. Um, I'll say sagittal cut between right and left cerebral hemispheres. Referring to the cerebrum. You have a right brain and a left brain. Now, basically, think of your brain has two brains, a right one and a left one. And when you cut right in half, you can see how the two cerebral hemispheres communicate. Um, there's a word called commissure. And that word means there are fibers or tracks of neurons that allow one brain region to communicate with another brain region. Fibers or tracks of cells that allow one brain region 
to communicate with another. No. No. Okay. Because in the brain, um, well, yeah, I mean, no. I, I don't think of it that way. Okay. I just think of it as this part talks to that part. And there's many different examples, but I, I, what I'm getting to is just, I just want you to know this structure here is the only really commissurate on your study list. Yeah. And this is the corpus callosum, right, that right there. Corpus callosum. The corpus callosum allows the right and left hemispheres to talk to each other. <coughs> allows right and left Allows right and left cerebral hemispheres to communicate or talk to each other. major brain region, it's colored in yellow here, this part uh, right there. Um, this part, it's kind of like a circular shape, and there's another little circle there. That's called the thalamus. That's another major brain region. I'll just kind of list it on the top here. I'll give you more description of what it does later. I just want to list the parts for now. But, uh, and the figure is colored yellow. And this part that's right below it, it's kind of shaped like that. It's kind of a weird shape. And that's the... Uh, it's, it's called the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus is a word that literally means below the thalamus. Now, the hypothalamus and the thalamus, um, I'll describe them later. The purple uh, region right there is called the midbrain. Right below that, it's all colored green, but this part right here that kind of sticks out a little bit, that's the pons. And right below that is a little olive-shaped thing that sticks out just a little bit. It's about right there. That's the medulla oblongata. Sometimes you can call it medulla for short, but the full name is medulla oblongata. So these last three structures are commonly referred to as the brain stem, these three. Below inferior to medulla, medulla oblongata, I'll just kind of draw it in here. I mean, they cut it, but that's the spinal cord, which we already had a lecture on. But of course, the spinal cord is a major division of the central nervous system. We already covered that, so you're not responsible for it on the next test. 
So if you look behind the brain, there's this blue structure here. It's cut in half on this picture. But that is the cerebellum. <coughs> cerebellum. Don't confuse cerebrum with cerebellum. Um, I think of, sometimes it's called the behind brain. Now we'll do a sheep brain dissection soon. Now I gotta look at the schedule, but I think we'll do it next week. I can see him sitting in the lab there. The sheep brain is a good approximation of the human brain. And um, when I did my cadaver presentation, I, I did show a, a real brain, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. yeah sometimes you get my presentations mixed up. But anyways, those are the major things you should be able to identify on a brain model just in terms of the parts. In terms of uh, the function, I realize that page number is out of date. Let me uh, get the book and give you a better one. So let me describe to you um, some basic functions of brain regions. So I already um, mentioned the corpus callosum. You don't have to write it, I'm just restating it allows right, left hemispheres. I didn't use the word talk. There is a communication between the right half of the brain and the left half of the brain, so it functions as one brain. And um, there, there's a phenomenon called lateralization because the right brain and the left brain are uh, better at doing certain things. page 444. Okay, page 437 is from the older edition. But it, it describes it nicely. Right brain, left brain. Execute um, different functions. Lateralization uh, means, well, let me give you an example. Um, the term cerebral dominance means one half can do something that the other half can't, or one half can do something better than the other can. And that being the case, you need the corpus callosum so the two can communicate when the other one's dominant in a task and the other one isn't. So, for example, let's say. Um, left 
versus right hemisphere. The left one, um, the term is used cerebral dominance. They usually refer to language because language is the thing that separates us from all the animals and any other organism on the planet. Okay, so language is very important, even in a basic anatomy uh, lecture on the brain. And so, in most people, the left hemisphere is for language. You, know, you can understand language, you can talk. Uh, the right hemisphere, they say, is mute, can't talk. But the right hemisphere is better for other things, like visual spatial skills. People are more artistic um, or more right-brained. Maybe musical talents. Language is better for things like um, math and analysis, things like that. So roughly, that, that this is what I mean by cerebral dominance or lateralization. Uh, the best way you can tell which one of your brains is more dominant is handedness. You have to know that the left brain controls the right side of the body. So if you're right-handed, you're probably left brain dominant and vice versa. I'm a lefty, so I'm more this. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a generalization. But the thing that is most crucial, that is true in most people, about 90%, language is uh, left brain. Okay. So we do want you to know there's some differences between right brain, right brain and left brain. And the corpus callosum makes it appear that your two brains function as one. And at the end of class today, I'll show a case study called split brain, where um, a subject had their corpus callosum severed on purpose to reduce seizures, okay? It's a remarkable case, and it's kind of trippy. <laughs> this guy has two brains, but he, they, they perform tests that allows you to see that his left brain doesn't know what his right brain is doing. We'll look at that later, but I want to move on. Corpus callosum, what's next? Okay, thalamus, what's the function of the thalamus? So what do I mean by sensory switchboard? Um, this region, it's composed of third order neurons. I don't know if you remember studying the spinal cord, we talked about the sensory pathways and I made you learn the first cell, second cell, and third cell, remember that? This is the third cell. All the cell bodies are there, and it just simply routes the incoming information to the right part of the cerebrum that is for feeling these body parts, so sensations, okay? So I'm gonna 
replace this stuff that I had previously. This is a frontal view, but this is a sagittal view. So I kind of want you to see, do you see how they color the outer part of this cortex uh, blue? <laughs> like this outer, I don't want to draw the whole thing, but this outer part, I think you can see it. And they color it all blue because blue means sensory for feel. Um, this piece of cerebrum is right here. cross-sectional view and there's a name for it it's called the post central gyrus so these third order neurons they route the information to the correct part of the post central gyrus, which is the cortex for um, feeling your body. Rounds info to the post central gyrus. The post-central gyrus is also called, it's the primary somatosensory cortex, aka primary <coughs> sensory cortex. So let me try to make sense of some of these words for you. The word gyrus, um, that means fold. Because do you see how the, the cerebrum, it's all wrinkled in appearance because of the folds, all right? So for example, um, a gyrus is a fold of neural tissue. But because you have folds, you have grooves in between the folds. And those are called, um, that's called a sulcus. A groove between the folds. The plural of gyrus is gyri. And the plural of sulcus is sulci. So just think of the, the cerebrum as gyri and sulci. But you have to be able to identify some of them. Okay? For example, I want you to identify the postcentral gyrus. But it's also called the primary somatosensory cortex. So this is A and P, so it's like an anatomist would call this the postcentral gyrus. It's, that's the one, but its function, its physiology is more the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, so why do they use the word cortex? The word cortex is used. The word cortex means bark. It's the outer part, so that's why um, it's only the outer part of this gyrus that is for sensation. Turns out, they colored it blue to let you know it's for sensation, but it's called the gray matter. The outer part of the cerebrum is gray matter. I taught neural tissue a long time ago. It was the fourth exam. It seems like it was held back. 
But remember this, gray matter is gray because it has the cell bodies, okay? And the gray matter is the out outer portion of the cerebrum. The inner portion, I mean, anything deep to it in here, is white matter. But anyways, the outer portion is the cortex of the cerebrum. So think gray matter, think cortex. Because that word is used a lot. So just think cortex, it's my brain. Okay. If you ever see the word cortico, over the years I come to realize that that means brain. It means the cortex, the gray matter, the outer part. It's the most valuable part of your brain. Everything works there. Okay, so we talk about it a lot even in this lecture. So anyways, um, there's a sulcus right here, right in front of the postcentral gyrus. It's called the central sulcus. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just list it on the board. It's just right next to the postcentral gyrus. So think you have this sulcus. And right behind it, you have this gyrus, the post-central gyrus. It's right behind the central sulcus. So anyways, I want to move on. That's just the thalamus. You route the information to the correct part of the post-central gyrus. All right, so you have the next part. Thalamus, a sensory switchboard, then you have hypothalamus. <laughs> Basically, the hypothalamus, it controls visceral functions. Another way to phrase that is um, auto, it regulates autonomic functions. Okay, I'll, I'll give a lecture on autonomic next time. Um, the autonomic nervous system is basically the next lecture on, on Friday. And um, we talk about it a lot in 431 in terms of it controls the pituitary. So it controls endocrine function. by controlling the master gland, the pituitary gland. The pituitary, I mean, it's right inferior to it. The arrow is pointing to the hypothalamus right there, but that right there is the pituitary, that little glandular structure just inferior to the hypothalamus. And you'll learn all the details of the pituitary in 431, uh, should you take it. And then inferior to that, you have uh, the arrows pointing to the midbrain. Midbrain has some structures that I want you to know. Within the midbrain, try to locate uh, cerebral peduncles and corpora quadrigemina. Let me write those terms on the board.
Peduncle means foot. And basically, the term describes how it looks. What I want you to know is that the cerebral peduncles contain cortical spinal tracts. So I'll put that as a bullet point under cerebral peduncles. Okay, the function of these tracks is um, they're going to relay motor commands um, from the precentral gyrus to the spinal cord. Relay. So this is for voluntary movement. Relay motor commands. essential gyrus to spinal cord. So another term for precentral gyrus it's the primary motor cortex that's why I show you um, uh, this right there Now they color um, the cortex red, because what does red signify? Motor. So this is a motor command. It starts here. If you want to wiggle your thumb, it starts here in my brain. And the signal is routed down through the midbrain, through the cerebral peduncles down to the spinal cord, out through the correct nerve that I can wiggle my thumb at. Okay. So um, the precentral gyrus on this figure here, it's right in front of the central sulcus. Pretty much that's it. And um, where's my pointer? It's very simple. It's pre-central gyrus, central sulcus, post-central gyrus. Okay, that's the one I have labeled. It. I don't have room to write all those other terms. So once again, what's the black line? Central sulcus. Okay, write it down again if you have to in your notes. Pre and post-central gyrus, central sulcus. That's the major motor and sensory part of the brain. Okay. There's other parts too that we'll learn, but for now. Just learn that the midbrain is routing signals from the primary motor cortex. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, pons medulla. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do corpora quadrigemina. Backtrack. Beep, 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 back it up. Now, it's difficult to see in a presentation. They're very small structures. But on the midbrain, there's this little gap there. It's part of the cerebral aqueduct. I'll get to that next. But this purple part, right, see how there's two dots? 
two bumps. Basically, you're looking at half the brain, so there would be four. So um, when you look at a brain in the lab, what, um, when you get the sheep brain, what you could do is you could like pull this cerebellum down and pull the cere uh, cerebrum up and get a view from the posterior view. And you should expect to see four structures, four little nodules. You have two superior and two inferior. The two superior ones are called the superior colliculi. And the two inferior ones are called the inferior colliculi. I'm sorry, that should be a double L. Double L, double L for colliculi. The, the superior colliculi, I'll put it under corpora quadrigemina. Therefore, uh, visual relays, okay, for visual things. Like um, if you're testing for some sobriety and the police officer makes you follow the pen light, see if you can track the pen light, that kind of thing. Be able to track things with your eye. Follow a moving object. Um, the inferior ones are for auditory relays. Inferior colliculi auditory relays. Like a startle reflex. A startle reflex is you're in a room and you hear a loud noise and you, and you react to it, you get scared. Okay? That's the normal response. You know, if you have a guy in a room, he looks kind of like he's out of it, there's a loud boom, he just kind of sits there, doesn't respond at all. Well, that's odd. I mean, maybe there's something wrong with his brain stem. So a startle reflex is a normal response and indicates your brain, or your, your midbrain is working just fine. Okay, now I want to move on. The pons and medulla. So of my two arrows, the first arrow, the top one, that, that's the pawns. So look where the pawns is. I think of the pawns, it's a bridge between the cerebrum and the cerebellum, okay? So basically pawns will relay info from cerebrum to cerebellum, which is behind it, but also from spinal cord to cerebellum. So it's kind of a bridge, it just is relating, relaying things from those two major regions back to the cerebellum. The medulla, Full name, medulla oblongata. You know, it's organized a lot like the spinal cord because it's continuous with it. it its main job, together with the pons, the medulla, it helps to regulate um, cardiorespiratory functions. It's very important. to regulate cardio the 
respiratory function. Your vital signs. So, you know, the brain stem, brain, brain stem is very uh, vital to that. Terms out, in terms of the anatomy, I know we're kind of looking at the brain by itself, but the medulla is pretty much at the level of foramen magnum. It's exiting the skull, right? Okay, the last thing here is the behind brain or the cerebellum. So let me read what I have on my slide for its description. Uh, the key word is it integrates information for coordinating and planning timing and pattern of skeletal muscle movements. So oh, let me kind of paraphrase that. Integrates info for planning, coordinated movements. Um, let me give you an example. Like reaching out and picking up a glass of water and bringing it to your face. Something you take for granted that you do every day. Drinking from a glass. Something as simple as that. Think of all the things that have to happen. We have to reach out and grab the glass, right? Duh. Well, don't you have to see the glass? Don't you have to feel the glass? Don't you have to grip it just right so you don't break it or drop it? There's all kinds of things that go on. And the cerebellum, it helps integrate and coordinate the plan movement for all of these things because it's receiving inputs from these three things. receives info from spinal cord. There's sensory info coming in. When you reach out for the glass, when you grab it, you want to feel the glass in your hand to know you got a grip on it. Motor, cerebral cortex. Your brain. I mean, just moving your hand back and forth to grab the glass and bring it to your mouth, that, that's all motor movement. Think how precise that movement has to be so you can make it touch your lips in exactly the right way. You can't miss your mouth, you can't dump the water on your face. I mean, it's a very delicate movement that we all take for granted. Well, the other thing is balance. Receives info from the inner ear. Maybe a good example for that is, um, again, when you test for sobriety, they make you walk in a straight line. Or because alcohol affects cerebellar function. Right? So if you're, like, if you're stumbling, It's like uh, not working well because this information is not being communicated very effectively. Uh, in terms of anatomy, when you cut this thing in half, there's a beautiful white 
looking structure. The white matter on the inside is in the shape of, it looks like a tree. So they call it arbor vitae, which means tree of life. So that's a structure to look for when you look at a cross-sectional view of the cerebellum. Arbor vitae means tree of life. It just describes the white matter appearance of white matter. So in addition to knowing the, the locations and basic brain parts and functions, also know some associated structures that support and protect the brain. And one of those are the ventricles of the brain, which are kind of like water balloons on the inside of the brain that allow CSF to circulate. So CSF is cerebral spinal fluid. It's a filtration of blood plasma. And it fills the ventricles and it circulates uh, throughout the brain and the whole central nervous system. So basically, be able to identify four brain ventricles. So I put these three figures uh, side by side because um, what we just looked at doesn't have the brain ventricles in it. Or it's harder to notice. You can kind of see that one there. That's the fourth ventricle. But this is what we just studied. This is a picture of just the brain stem and cerebellum with the ventricles. This is just the ventricles, the ventricles only. And we have models of this in the classroom. But I like how it kind of shows how the ventricles really are associated with the brain. Okay. Now you have two large C-shaped ventricles. They look like ram horns. You have two lateral ventricles. ones that are roughly C-shaped, that one, you know, and the one kind of next to it, it's hard to see there, but you, the, that, that one is a lateral ventricle. So that's two of the four, okay? Now there's a third and a fourth ventricle, and that's simply what their names are. You have a third ventricle, and you have a fourth ventricle. The third ventricle is located between the two thalamus, thalamuses, and I'm not sure you're pluralizing. One third ventricle located between Thalamus. It's this one right here, these blue. It's that, that little thing right there, a little sliver. And there's a little hole in it. Okay, so that's the third ventricle. That's where you look for it. So on this figure, again, it's right there. There's a little hole there. 
there's a purpose for that hole, okay? Because I don't know if you look on this picture here, there's this little structure that goes through that hole. Where I drew that little blue dot is the thalamus, but it's specifically called the intermediate mass of the thalamus. So in your notes, write that the third ventricle has a hole in it that accommodates the intermediate mass of the thalamus. as a whole for intermediate mass of thalamus. The fourth ventricle is located between pons and cerebellum. That little thing on this figure, it's down there. That little thing has these little arms coming out. That's the fourth. You can even see it here. It's kind of diamond shaped. That's where I would put a pin for the fourth ventricle. I'll just put fourth. It's between the pond cerebellum. So just identify those two things and look for the diamond-shaped gap in between them. It's filled with CSF. It's the fourth ventricle. It turns out the third and fourth ventricle are connected by something called the cerebral aqueduct. Cerebral aqueduct connects it's literally a little aqueduct or canal that connects third fourth ventricles there's a little it's right there it's just just coming out of the third ventricle it's hard it's hard to see it's like a little line I'll draw a little line there it's better when you look at the model, so it's there too. That orange line that I tried to draw over the picture there is the location of, I'll draw it here, cerebral aqueduct. associated brain structures are the connective tissue coverings called the dural septa. Okay, so know the four ventricles of the brain, also know the dural septa that divide the brain as it sits in the cranial base. So this is a very useful picture. It's not a full craniotomy, it's a quarter craniotomy. They cut out half of um, the skull cap. Anyways, I like this picture here. This is brain in, no brain, okay? So that's what your skull looks like without a brain in it, but the dura septa are still there. So brain in, brain out, but what are all of these partitions there? There's only two I want you to know. This one that separates the two cerebral hemispheres is called the falx. And this one that kind of is in the um, transverse plane is called the tentorium cerebellum. Those are the two I want you to know. So let's talk about the falx first. So the falx cerebri is the full name.
It is dura mater that separates the two cerebral hemispheres, the right from the left. So remember what it separates, be able to identify it. Uh, that's why I put that red dotted line. Because that's kind of where it will be dividing the two cerebral hemispheres. Um, we also have the tentorium. The tentorium, its full name is tentorium cerebelli. And it separates the cerebrum above from the cerebellum below. Pretty simple, those two, Falks and Tentorium. Uh, just what it divides. Here's another view of the, the Tentorium cerebellum. So this is a superior view. They cut it out on the right side, and on the left side they left it in. <coughs> so underneath it would be the cerebellum, down in the posterior cranial fossa. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's review the, the meninges. It's really simple because we've already talked about it with, uh, in terms of the spinal cord. But look at all the layers. All of this is bone up here. But look how many layers are between the bone and this tissue here. That's cortex. So then uh, to review your layers, um, who remembers what the innermost layer on the brain is? I'll draw it right here. It means intimate mother. Pia mater. Pia mater. What about the, the one that means spider? Remember that one? I'll draw it right here. And has all those arachnoid granulations, all these things drawn here. The arachnoid mater. And what's the name of the one that means tough mother? The dura mater. Okay, so it's all this. They draw it in here. And they even, they even illustrate some of the blood vessels that are inside the dura, but it's, I'll just kind of draw it as all this, this thick dura mater. Okay, so that's a review of all the dura, um, but I also want you to know that CSF, it circulates in the subarachnoid space. CSF is secreted by the choroid plexus and circulates in the subarachnoid space.
So if you look for the arachnoid matter, the space underneath it is kind of where you have the CSF circulate. Okay. So let me erase this now. So the other structure you got to know is choroid plexus. I'll show you that. So choroid plexus secretes CSF into the ventricles and the arachnoid granulations absorb it. So think of it this way. You have to have an input-output. If you're secreting a fluid into something, you don't want it to explode. So you have to have an output. The arachnoid granulations let the CSF out and recirculate. Okay. So you think of the choroid plexus. That's your input. What, what do I mean by that? You're secreting CSF into the subarachnoid space. The cerebral spinal fluid. So it circulates and you need a way for the CSF to exit into the blood. That's the arachnoid granulations. So like I said, they absorb CSF back into venous blood. So we have to spend, talk, um, spend time talking about why you even need CSF. Turns out whole blood is toxic to brain tissue. So there are two barriers that we teach. One is called the blood brain barrier, and the other one is called the blood CSF barrier. So what I say in that slide is that the blood-brain barrier is a barrier between whole blood and the interstitium of the CNS, all, all the fluids that surround the tissue, basically. take a look at a picture of what the barrier is. Okay, uh, But now, before that, I want to define what's called the blood CSF barrier. Uh, this is a barrier between whole blood and uh, where CSF circulates. Simply a barrier between blood and CSF. CF, CSF is blood that's just been filtered. Let's see here. Okay, this picture shows both. Here you have a capillary. <coughs> Capillaries carry the blood, and capillaries norm normally exchange with their um, environment. However, in this case, um, you have a choroid plexus 
<clears throat> oh, I should probably tell you this. You got two of them. Be able to identify the choroid plexus with the third and the fourth ventricles. Remember, this is the structure that secretes CSF. So the core plexus is a blood is the blood CSF barrier. So this structure is the barrier. What happens is ependymal cells have tight junctions and they surround these capillaries. Those tight junctions are essentially what make this the blood CSF barrier because you really limit the filtration. Okay, so um, that's shown here. Um, this blood vessel is allowing things to exchange. But because it's surrounded by this big wall of cells, these are the ependymal cells right there. And if you look really closely at the figure between the cells, there's tight junctions. Okay, so that's why it's, it's, sometimes students say they forget to look at the details. That's the detail I want you to see. By having tight junctions, it, it, you only allow very small molecules to get through. And the, uh, everything you see here in blue, this is all CSF. And the key components are water and oxygen and glucose. Okay, here are the contents of the CSF. I would just say H2O, O2, uh, glucose, energy for the brain. That's the main thing. Now, look at the ependymal cells here. What I've noticed is, oh, they have arrows that go in and out. So does that mean there are tight junctions, yes or no, if things can pass? No. The answer is no. So these ependymal cells have tight junctions, these don't. So when the CSF goes to the other side, that's basically the CNS interstitial. So all of this brown stuff is the um, surrounding um, the neurons. And this right here is a picture of the blood brain barrier. Okay. So here's our blood vessel. And the thing I want you to know about the blood brain barrier. capillaries are surrounded by um, astrocytes with feet, perivascular feet.
surrounded by astrocytes. with feet, and that's the key uh, barrier. The feet completely surround the cell. There's an astrocyte right there, and what they're, what they're drawing, I don't want to try to draw everything, but I mean, I'll just try to just give you an idea so when you study the figure, you, you can know where to look. There's these little feet right there they completely surround the cells of the capillary. Okay, what the feet do is they induce the endothelial cells of the capillary to form tight junctions that limit the filtration, making it a blood-brain barrier. So let me write that down. The feet induce endothelial cells Those are the cells of the capillaries. To form tight junctions. And that is the blood-brain barrier. Here's a better picture of that. Let me get my remote. Normal capillaries don't have these astrocytes, and they allow more filtration of other things from the plasma. Here. There's blood flowing through, there's a capillary, and it's literally one layer thick. Things can get by. These are pericytes that help maintain the basement membrane around the endothelial cell. Here in the nervous system, we have a capillary, but here's an astrocyte with its foot, and they completely surround the capillary and they induce the formation of tight junctions right there. Okay, so that's figures from the Marriott textbook. You can take a look at that. So I want you to know both of those barriers. So when CSF, when it's secreted by the choroid plexus, it fills the ventricles in the subarachnoid space. CSF, it acts like a shock absorber for the brain. If you ever had a, heard of a spinal tap procedure, if they suspect meningitis, and an inflammation of the meninges, they want to withdraw some of that for analysis. It should be clear, but if it's cloudy, that means there's an infection. But even if you remove just a little bit, it's like when you move it, you, you sit up or something, like, ow, it hurts, you get a headache. It's like your brain is bouncing around and it's hitting the inside of your skull. So normally that thin layer of fluid minimizes that. Kind of like when you pack tofu in water. Okay, the, the block of tofu remains unblemished when you cut it open. Um, the CSF kind of acts like that for the brain. And this figure teaches you how it uh, circulates. I tried to reduce the figure to make it simpler to teach. So basically, it's teaching you CSF circulation throughout the entire central nervous system. I don't know. I don't know. If they're pretty sure it's meningitis, I'm pretty sure they would order it. Okay. Yeah. In this figure, step one is the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus. Secrete CSF. Again, it's in two places. I'll put third and fourth in parentheses, referring to the third and fourth ventricles. So on the figure, look for a bright red structure. If you were to identify it, I would point to um, this structure here, this little bright red set of capillaries, and that right there. Both are secreting CSF. It's going to circulate in the subarachnoid step 
um, excuse me, it's going to circulate in the subarachnoid space. That's step two. Step three um, and step four is observed into the three and four are kind of the same thing. CSF absorbed by arachnoid granulations. the CSF is back into the sea of blood. CSF is back into the uh, venous blood. The steps are easier to see um, from this figure. If you look closely at um, this right there. I kind of blew up part of it because I wanted you to note all the layers. So let me talk over that figure one more time then we'll look at this. Step one, there's choroid plexus here and there. All the arrows are showing you the CSF circulating all around here. So here's the number three. It circulates and finally is absorbed as step number four in this little structure there called the arachnoid granulation. And finally, it's in the blue blood, which is the venous blood that will drain back to the heart. And so if you look closely at the top of that figure, I numbered it so you can recognize all the different structures and uh, match it with these steps. So let me kind of like tell you what those numbers are. Number one, that's the subarachnoid space. That's where the CSF is. So on this figure, all the light blue is the CSF circulating. Number two, the arachnoid mater. Number three is a little piece of arachnoid matter that kind of sticks up into the venous blood. That's called the, um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, skipped, I skipped to this one. Here's number three here. Okay, number three, that gray layer is the dura mater. In this part of the brain, the dura mater has two parts, three and four. Three is called the membrane part. Four is called the periosteal part because it's stuck to the bottom of the skull cap. So three is dura mater. Membrane part. Four, also dura mater. But it's the periosteal part. <coughs> Five is the arachnoid granulation.
This is the one that takes the CSF and puts it back into the venous blood. So note arachnoid granulation. That's the actual structure that absorbs CSF. <coughs> Six is pointing to venous blood. Venous blood is blood that is it's called spent blood. It's been, um, it's deoxygenated. The oxygen has already been dropped off to the tissue. It's just returning to the heart to recirculate. Anyways, in this part of the brain, it's right along the sagittal uh, plane. That structure that it's in is the superior sagittal sinus. So the venous blood in superior sagittal sinus. The superior sagittal sinus, the sinus, think of it as a vein. Right down the middle of your head. There's many other sinuses that you'll learn in 431 because it's part of uh, the circulation, the blood vessels that we teach. Because it's in this figure, I thought I'd show you just that one. It's right down the center of your head. If you were to cut and do a craniotomy, you can get a nice view of it. This channel running from front to back. And all of these structures here are the arachnoid granulations that dump the CSF back into the blood. If you were to cut right here and look at it in a uh, coronal section, it's a triangular shaped structure. You can see the arachnoid granulations in there. On this figure, it's that structure right down the middle of your head. Okay. On this figure, it's in the falks. Superior sagittal sinus is literally inside uh, that dura septa. It, it, there's a blue thing right in there. And they even cut out a section right there so you could see inside the superior sagittal sinus. So, I'll, I'll add on to this. It's in the faults. We haven't done half sheets in a while. Um, I'm going to do that right now just to break it up a little bit and pass these out. Today to 29. Oh, that's right. 5-1. Okay, number one. Number one, name four lobes of the cerebral. Right 
left hemispheres. Number three, which part? Functioned as a sensory switchboard. Which part has cerebral peduncles? Number five, what else we talk about today? Name for brain ventricles. Number six. Name two dural septa. Right, that's enough for now. Four now.
You know, I think now's a good time for the break. So if you're done with these, hang out to your half sheet, but go right into break and come back in 15 minutes. Um, I do want to finish these lecture slides, so when you return from break, we'll, we'll continue with the lecture.